You've got two sides. The election couldn't possibly be clearer. You've got one side that wants to tear the country down, wants to tear down the economic principles that help build the country. You've got another side that wants to support our founding principles, wants to support freedom, wants to support America. And you've got this man in the middle, President Donald Trump, who is here uh, with the forces of conservatism. We are joined by one of the great conservative voices of our time, a writer, a filmmaker, a commentator. He does everything. The one and only Dinesh D'Souza. Dinesh, thank you for coming on. My pleasure. Looking forward to it. So, Dinesh, I have always enjoyed your movies. I've enjoyed going to the premieres of your movies, which are always extremely fun here in Hollywood. You've got this movie coming out, Trump Card, and yet we're living in a time when no one gets to go to the movies. Yeah, the theaters are, you know, in a strange position in this age of COVID. And so I made the decision to release the movie, Trump Card, uh, to video on demand. So you can buy a physical DVD or you can watch it on a whole bunch of platforms from iTunes to Google to YouTube, many others through a number of cable channels as well. So it's essentially a movie now that's pay-per-view. You can rent it or you can buy it. And you can watch it at home and on any device. I mean, I hope people watch it on TV because it was made for the big screen. Uh, you can still watch it on a computer or a phone, but TV would definitely be the best way. Well, I just watched it. I highly recommend everybody go watch it as well. You know, there are so many issues that we're thinking about in this 24-7 news cycle. I feel we all have the attention span of fruit flies. And you've got the Supreme Court nominations. You've got economic considerations, you've got foreign policy, you've got all these things. The movie, much like the book that the movie is based on, focuses on socialism. Socialism is the big issue. AOC has been pushing socialism. The head of the Democrat Party says that this socialist is the future of the Democratic Party. Where does, where does socialism fit among all the other things we've got to be weighing at the voting booth? I think socialism is the key. It is the destination for the left. And a good way to think about it is, you know, there's some internal debate. Is Biden a socialist? Uh, Elizabeth Warren, is she a socialist light? Here's a good way to think about it. If you think of the free market at one end of the spectrum and socialism, which we can define loosely here as state control of the economy, uh, at the other end of the spectrum, ask yourself this question, which Democrat is pulling in the free market direction? Answer, none of them. They're all pulling in the socialist direction. Now, they differ from one another as push differs from shove. It's a matter of degree. But the bottom line of it is they would all move America toward the United States of Socialism. And the movie explores what does that actually mean? What is the type of socialism that they're pushing? Is it a good thing? And if it's a bad thing, how do we stop it? I know President Trump has sort of broken with some Republican and conservative orthodoxy, at least of the last few decades, particular on free trade. He's saying we're getting bad trade deals. We need some trade protections if, if China's not going to play ball. He's kind of questioned some of these broader trade agreements like NAFTA. So some left-wing critics will say, well, Trump is just put it, pushing for a different kind of socialism, a different kind of state control. What do they get wrong? I mean, what, what, do, do we have to embrace totally free, unfettered markets here to oppose socialism? Or is there something more specific? Well, I think the way that Trump looks at it, and, and I agree with him, I actually was on the, other, the sort of libertarian side of the fence. The libertarians tend to look at the world as a single market, hmm. and they tend to look at uh, of the free flow of people and the free flow of products as being essential. That's how they define, if you will, free trade and free movement. Uh, but I think Trump realizes, wait a minute, that's actually not the world we live in. The world we live in is divided into countries. And just as we have individual interests and business interests, we have an American interest. And there's a tendency for the libertarian to miss that, to miss that we are a team called America. And it's the job of the president to look out for that team. It's not his job to promote global welfare. It's as he's elected to promote the welfare of the people who voted for him and the people also who voted against him, but who belong to the same community. So in the trade deal, basically Trump is saying, listen, if you have tariffs on the other side, the Chinese side, uh, the Japanese side, the French, where well, they won't let us sell our products over there, why should we promiscuously say to them, listen, you can openly sell your products over here. Let's have a deal in which we agree to open up both sides. And it seems to me that in the end, if that's successful, uh, that will pr promote more free trade and not less. 
I think that's completely right. I think President Trump has said that as well. He says he, he likes trade. He likes when we can make some money. He likes when we can sell our goods, but you can't get ripped off. You want, you want to be in a, a trade regime that works for both people. I, I know sometimes when, when people hear economic arguments, their eyes glaze over. There is, there is a reason that economics has been called the dismal science. Uh, is that what we're talking about here with socialism? Is it just some eggheads on spreadsheets or is there, is there more to it? Is there a, a cultural or, or even deeper component to socialism that, that threatens the country? Yeah, I think that um, that's uh, the right way to think about socialism is as a kind of theft scheme. And here's what I mean. If somebody were to say to you, go to your neighbor's house, um, open his refrigerator and eat his stuff and then look around. And if you see nice things, art on the walls and so on, take them, uh, confiscate it and bring it over to your house uh, and put it up on your wall. Now, you might say, most people would say, that's horrible. Why would I do that? I'm not a thief. And if I did do it for whatever reason, uh, I would feel terrible. My conscience would really uh, tell me I'm doing something very wrong. Now, imagine if you're now approached by the socialist who says, Michael, I've got news for you. You know all that nice stuff in your neighbor's house? It really belongs to you. And if this comes as a surprise uh, because he hasn't uh, stolen it from you, don't worry. His great, great, great grandfather actually at one fine day stole it from your great, great, great grandfather. So it's really yours. But here's the wonderful news. You don't have to break into his house. You don't have to confiscate his stuff. We, the state, will do that for you. And we'll keep some of it for ourselves, but we'll give the rest of it to you. So you can see what's going on here. They're making you, Michael, feel good about being a thief. Essentially, socialism here is about the annihilation of conscience, hmm. about eradicating that little voice in our head that tells you, don't do that. That's evil. That's wrong. They want to snuff out that little voice. There's an example you gave a, a few years ago, maybe more than a few years ago now, that I steal shamelessly. I loved this description, which is that you're walking down the street and you see a bum and you've, I don't know, you've got a sandwich or something and the bum is hungry. And so you can, you can give him your sandwich and then there, that's a moral transaction, right? He's grateful. You've done an act of charity. That's great. And it's all well and good until you're walking down the street and Barack Obama shows up on a white horse with a gun and he says, you better give that man your sandwich. And there, no moral transaction has taken place. The bum feels entitled, I feel resentful, and Obama robbed me at gunpoint. That, that moral calculation has totally been, been shifted from what otherwise would be a moral and charitable act. That's absolutely right. Uh, essentially, what happens is that socialism strips the virtue entirely out of the transaction, even though one could say, hey, the outcome is the same. In both cases, the guy ended up with a sandwich or with half your sandwich. But the fact that it was in one case compelled by force makes it not a good deed on your part, uh, no obligation or even gratitude on his part, uh, and makes the state a kind of corrupt colluder with what is ultimately a form of extortion. Do you think, Dinesh, I know that for decades, particularly after William F. Buckley Jr. in the, in the post-war conservative movement, there was this fusion of libertarians who were very interested in the economic issues and of social conservatives and traditionalists who were more interested in, uh, I don't know, God and guns and, you know, all sorts of cultural matters. And they obviously had a common enemy in the Soviet Union, which was both collectivist and atheist. But in recent years, that has frayed a little bit. I, I even have to say, as someone who I consider myself very traditional, culturally conservative, I've worried that there is a kind of softening on socialism that has gone on in some parts of the conservative movement. Do you see that happening? If so, do you, how do you think we can rectify that? Well, I think there's, there is a remaking of the parties to some degree. I mean, first of all, it's because the situation is completely different. The old battle was a Cold War against a foreign opponent. And so the, the Cold War defined, if you will, the two political camps. And now it's, I call it in the movie, the new one, Trump card, I call it a Cold Civil War. <laughs> so we're dealing with a domestic opponent. And so naturally, the dividing lines are going to be somewhat different. The Republican Party really used to be the party of the rich. That wasn't just the left's caricature, but basically rich people voted for the Republicans. But you'll notice that's no longer true. The richest people in this country support the Democrats. Big corporations not only give money to the Democratic Party, they give money to Antifa and Black Lives Matter. So what I'm finding is the Republican Party is becoming the party of the middle class and the working class. And that's a massive shift because the working class, white and black, 
was essentially the, the bedrock of the FDR coalition. That was the backbone of the Democratic Party. And yet, if you find a working class guy today, chances are much better you'll find him not at the uh, ACLU or at the union meeting. You're going to more likely find him in the Trump rally. Right. He's not going to be wearing some sort of silly uh, coexist sign on his shirt or something. He's probably more likely to be wearing a MAGA hat. But then this, this raises this point that the left always brings up. They say, these rubes, these deplorables, these bitter clingers, they're so stupid that they're voting against their own interests. Because look, the left and the socialists, they're willing to give them a bunch of free stuff. So are these people just just absolute maniacs for rejecting that and embracing a more traditional and conservative message? The, the genius of Trump, I think, is that he has appealed to these people both on their economic and their cultural interests. Remember, for years, Republicans would, in a sense, uh, turn to the working class and say, listen, we know you don't agree with us on economic issues, but on the other hand, you're pro-life, aren't you? Mm -hmm. So let us you let's let that trump, if you will, your economic concerns. Trump made an all-out appeal to these people and said, listen, who has stripped away your jobs? By and large, what's happened is that's the product of a certain kind of blind globalization, which we have not been attentive to our national interest. And the reason that journalists and lawyers and a lot of the DC types never cared about this is they don't care about you. They don't care about your life, your livelihood, your communities, your schools, uh, drug problems in your communities. Well, I do. I do. So the bottom line of it is, yes, it's true that a working class guy can say, listen, I don't have a job. But no worries, I can sit on my couch forever and collect a check from the Democrats. They'll give me universal basic income so I can be a lifelong drone. In fact, that's what they want you to be. Yeah. Um, and then they want to create perhaps the kind of intergenerational dependency. In other words, they want to do what white people, what to white people, what they've already done basically to the black community. I think the good news is that Trump is saying to whites and blacks, listen, you can break out from this dependency. You can be a free American again and a free American with a real job. And so that's where I think the populist Republican Party is. And I really don't see any future in turning back. I, I agree entirely. And I, I've noticed something in recent days that President Trump is calling attention to a very specific issue that a lot of people didn't think he would call attention to. That is the academy, higher education, specifically critical theory and sort of various leftist ideologies that have permeated the academy that in many ways launched you into the national discussion with one of your great books, which I highly recommend people read as well, Illiberal Education. You, you were sounding the alarm bell on, on this kind of rot that was going on in the American mind decades ago. And it would seem that uh, it, the situation that you were describing has followed the course that you predicted. It's gotten so much worse. Is there hope for a country that is constantly educating its students and its future generations to hate itself? No. Um, and I think the big difference uh, between now and then, when I wrote a liberal education and I described some of the insanity that was going on on the campus, and by the way, it was not as bad as it is now, yeah. a lot of people off campus, leftists, would say, come on, Dinesh, you're exaggerating. Your book is a collection of anecdotes. You're overstating the problem. The campus isn't really a lunatic asylum. Uh, and my view is, listen, it is a bit of an asylum, but Fortunately, it is walled off from the rest of society. Fortunately, in a sense, people, when they go off to college, they go on to a kind of a, 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 a special kind of community with its own rules. But now I think what's happened is that not only have the campuses become crazier, but the craziness has metastasized into the larger culture. You could almost say that academia is the theory and Antifa is the practice. Mm. Because if you believe your country is awful, and it wasn't just um, the slave owners and the Confederates, but it's... Abraham Lincoln is awful, and George Washington is awful, and Frederick Douglass, the great abolitionist, is awful. Pretty soon they'll be saying Martin Luther King is awful. And the, so the idea here is to pull down their statues and desecrate their legacy. These are the doctrines that have been taught in academia for a long time, but they've been picked up now by Hollywood and the media and blasted into the larger culture. So right now, essentially, the campus's ideology has become the ideology of the left nationwide. Do you have, I'm just looking for some glimmer of hope, even as we see our country on fire all around us, do you think that the, the shutdown of the campuses because of the COVID lockdowns, do you think that that will give us a chance to sort of break this mania that has overtaken American education? Or is that just a mirage? Is, is the academy going to continue its liberal, uh, liberal project uh, regardless? 
I think so. It will continue that project. I don't think that we can reasonably expect to take back, you know, 300 or 400 campuses. That's not going to happen. The only way it's going to happen, in my opinion, is if we, uh, we meaning our side, invents the academic iPhone. If we can deliver mm -hmm. high quality, world class academic and educational services at a fraction of the price, that would be essentially turning all of academia into a rotary phone. It'd be mm -hmm. obsolete. They'd have the buildings and they would hang around for a while, but they wouldn't hang around all that long because there's just a better product on the market. Um, in Hollywood, I'm trying to not only make feature films, I released my first feature film called Infidel in theaters now. Why? Because I wanted to make not just a Christian movie or a conservative movie, but a mainstream political thriller with Jim Caviezel in the lead. So I can compete with big Hollywood movies like yeah. Tenet or the Russell Crowe movie. And this shows us that we don't just criticize the left, but we challenge them and defeat them, we beat their business model, and we can show that whatever they can do, we can do better. I think you're a great example uh, uh, for people who say, oh, it's just a lost cause. There's no way we can win in Hollywood. There's no way that we can win in, in these spaces that are now dominated by the left. Your movies have been extraordinarily successful. I mean, they've, they've done very, very well. This is, what is, is this your fifth movie now or? Well, it's my fifth and I also have the feature film. So I've got Trump right. Card is my fifth documentary. Now that's not in the theater. I should let people know yeah. that's available on video on demand. And if you go trumpcardthemovie.com, you can buy it from Walmart or Target and DVD, or you can watch it on a whole bunch of platforms from Google to YouTube to iTunes, Apple iTunes, and so on. Uh, so yes, I think that, look, it's harder for our side because if you're Michael Moore or Oliver Stone, you wanna make a movie, you go to a studio, they go, here's $10 million, here's $20 million. And then once you make the movie, hey, you're on the Today Show, hey, you're on The View, hey, you're on this, hey, you're on that for us. We got to do the legal work. We got to put yeah. the business plan together. We got to raise the money. We got to make the movie. And then we've got to market it with absolutely no help from these cultural elites. So I don't count on them. I don't rely on them. But bottom line of it is you have to have this broad ensemble of skills from that are financial skills, but also creative skills and marketing skills to be able to pull it off. And, and by the way, you need courage because sometimes, for instance, if you were to make a movie critical of Barack Obama, then the bureaucracy of the federal government might become weaponized against you to selectively punish you. I'm just you, a totally hypothetical example, obviously. But that- Well, not to, me not to mention these guys are now on the board at Netflix. And so they have a mm. lot of influence in the, in the even the market institutions that are instrumental in promoting movies. Fortunately, again, our movies are done well. So we have a good way of getting them out there and distributing them well, uh, and I'm very happy about that. But long term, we've got to do a lot more of this. And the same thing with media. The left just has a much wider media reach than we do. So ultimately, I don't see how we can win long term if we don't create some important beachheads. And this yeah. isn't just about this election because it affects every election. Right. And in the movie, in Trump Card, you, you describe us presently as in a cold civil war. The nice thing about the last Cold War is that it never got all that hot. You know, there were there were hot spots here and there, but there was a peaceful conclusion to it. Do you do you foresee a peaceful conclusion to this, or do you see America literally breaking apart? No, I, I think it. I think we can have a peaceful conclusion. It's going to require really both sides, but mostly their side, to come to their senses. Now, I predict if Trump wins, they will go crazier in the short term, and we have to sort of be ready for that. But in the long term, it's a very good thing because. The only thing that will stop them is holding them accountable. It's kind of like if an Antifa guy breaks a window and nobody says anything, he'll break all the windows yeah. in the neighborhood. He'll, he defines success uh, as how many windows are broken. And his aggression is tempted by our passivity. So the more you hold them accountable, suddenly some Antifa guy, you know, he, he beats somebody up, he gets two years in prison, his friends go, oh, wow, this is probably not a good idea. So then they all go home. So this is how you put the stuff in check. The problem that happened in 1860 was it got out of hand. Uh, this that was a by the way that was a civil war that was forty years brewing, and therefore yeah. once it uh, was unleashed, it was unleashed at gale force. I hope we can avert that kind of outcome here. I think we can, but to do that, we have to hold the left accountable, and we have to all live by the same rules. Right. I do sadly see some parallels now as we talk about the Democrats trying to add new states to the union and how that will upset the balance of power. The talk of the balance of power in the court does have some some overtones of the 1850s, unfortunately. So I, I don't think it's hyperbolic to say that we're in a very precarious place as a country. Before I let you go, I do have to ask the kind of pressing political predictions. Do you have any thoughts on what's going to happen November 3rd or in any of the days afterward? 
I have a good feeling about it. I trust my own instincts. It's, I don't go so much by the polls. Now, the polls do give me pause yeah. uh, because we should always um, uh, not confuse what we want to happen with what is going to happen. I remember in 2012 when I would tell people, I think Romney is going to lose. They say, what? I thought you were a conservative. I thought you were a Republican. I, I go, I am. I'm voting for Romney. But I'm telling you what I think is going to happen, not yeah. what I want to happen. But I think the left has the same disease. They're so desperate for Trump to be defeated that they massage the polls. They oversample the Democrats. They ask questions in a leading way. So I wouldn't be surprised if the polls grossly understate Trump's support and he pulls off another big, nasty surprise for them in November. That would be a wonderful Trump card uh, in November 4th or in the long litigation that is no doubt to follow. Uh, that would be pretty fun as well. Yes, it will. I think the bottom line here is that the left knows that we are the party of the nice guys and they take advantage of it. Yeah. This is why they want to pack the court. They're convinced that even if we come to power, we won't pack the court on our side. Yeah. They can knock down our monuments. They're confident that we won't knock down their monuments. They can use the deep state against us. They know that even if we controlled all the branches of government, we wouldn't dream of using the deep state against them. So the bottom line I'm trying to say is that because Republicans are seen as nice guys, the left takes advantage of our innocence, if you will, our virtue in order to bend the rules on their side in the full confidence that it won't be done to them. I think that is a, an astute diagnosis. I think that probably is what brought us President Trump in the first place. You know, you feed up a bunch of nice guys and uh, eventually if the left won't relent, you need a tough guy to go in there and clean house. Uh, we can all hope that he continues to clean house after uh, November 3rd. In the meantime, highly recommend everyone goes out, watches Trump card. It's not in the theaters. You know, the theaters are in kind of mayhem right now with the lockdowns. So you got to get it. W what are the streaming platforms, Dinesh? So go to TrumpCardTheMovie.com. You can buy the DVD from Target or Walmart, uh, and you can watch it on Amazon iTunes by download or Google or Fandango. There's a whole bunch of platforms. You can generally get it through your cable platforms as well. TrumpCardTheMovie.com. That's where you can go get it. For now, we know big tech wants to uh, kick us all off. So for, for now, you can go get it. Uh, would, would definitely recommend you do it. Dinesh, thank you as always. Great to talk to you. And we will, uh, we will keep our fingers crossed through the movie. I'm, I'm sure it will do very well. And then through November 3rd to see if we can <laughs> hold on to this country of ours for a little while longer. For sure. Thank you very much. All right. All right.